Cheers and welcome to Americans Learn. My name is Lauren and today I am diving back into some fat electrician. This is America's top spy of World War II, Virginia Hall, the limping lady. And now look, y'all, you know I'm going to be in for this. I love a, I love a spy story and I love a lady being badass story. So that we're looking like we're getting both of those in this today and I am living for it. So I don't really want to take too much time with this, I just kind of want to get into it and start learning. So, Mr. Fat Electrician, learn me about this lady, please. Let's go. I don't have a daughter, but if I did, this is who I would want her to look up to. <laughs> Today, we're talking about Virginia Hall, a.k.a. the limping lady, probably the most effective American spy of World War II, and she managed to do that with one leg. But first, a word from our sponsors. Damn. This video is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. If you've been on the internet in the last oh, decade, you, you know what Ridge Wallet is. I'm not gonna waste your time. Ridge hired me to tell you to buy your dad a Ridge Wallet for Christmas. If your dad's anything like or mine, me. his wallet probably looks like a goot. I need a, I need a Ridge <laughs> Ah. Uh, my wallet, I have, I love my wallet, but it is a giant leather thing. It's so big. Bible and his back hurts and nobody has ever pointed out to this poor guy that hey maybe your back hurts because every time you sit down you've got a phone book underneath one butt cheek and you look like you're the leaning tower of pizza inside of a chair so head over to ridge.com slash tfe and shop the holiday sale you're going to save up to 30 percent and when you use my link you're also going to be automatically enrolled in a chance to win a four thousand dollar bundle from ridge let's oh, get wow. back to the video all right virginia hall okay. born in 1906 in baltimore she grew up in a really hey. Baltimore represent, we gonna drink for my home city. I live in Chicago now, but I've spent most of my life in Baltimore. Wealthy family and was a complete tomboy the entire time. And her father absolutely loved it. He taught her how to hunt and he completely endorsed her being not very ladylike all of the time. In addition to being a tomboy, she was also highly intelligent, graduating from high school with ease and getting accepted into the top female colleges wow. in the country. Her mother, on the other hand, had different plans because immediately after high school, she expected Virginia to get married to a young man from another wealthy family in the area so they could combine their family businesses. So she gets engaged to this guy at 18 years old. Fast forward one year, she's 19 years old and she keeps catching her fiance cheating on her. So she calls off the engagement and runs off to college despite her, her mother's wishes. She immediately attends the top two female colleges in the country, Radcliffe and Barnard, which are the equivalent of Harvard and Columbia. She studies economics and foreign languages, deciding that she wants to become an American diplomat. She wants to live in an embassy and represent the United States of America. However, this is the 1920s and the odds of a female landing that job are slim to none, but she wants to maximize her chances, so she learns as many foreign languages as possible. She becomes fluent in German, Italian, and French and finishes college abroad, studying in Germany, France, and Austria. Wow. While finishing college in Europe in the late 1920s, she would bear witness to the birth of fascism and the rise of the Nazi party and have a better understanding of how dangerous that ideology was than 99% of Americans. She would return home in 1929. A few months after that, the stock market would crash, the Great Depression would start, and her father, a wealthy business owner, would lose almost everything, and the increased stress would lead to him having a heart attack and dying. This made Virginia even more determined to accomplish her goal of becoming an American diplomat, so she got a job working for the U.S. Embassy in Poland as a secretary. She worked there for several years, and every year she would apply for a promotion to become a U.S. diplomat, and every year something went wrong. The first year, they lost her application. The second year, her application made it through because she delivered it herself, and she was a shoe in She could speak four languages, she was a college graduate, she was highly intelligent, well-spoken, so she passed the application portion of the hiring process and had to have an in-person interview see this is where i feel like it's gonna hurt her the first job i applied for it might and the first job i applied for was at freaking five below they lost my application they lost my application twice so i went in again and i was like i went in multiple times and i was like i i, I think i decided no, you know what? You don't get to, like, I want this job. I need this job. Like, I needed a job. And I feel like they were just, like, you know, I didn't have another, any any job experience other than, like, babysitting. So they were like, no, absolutely not. So <laughs> I basically went in and was like, you all have lost my application twice. I would like to fill it out in front of you and give it to you. Um, And then ultimately what I ended up doing was I filled out the application, gave it to them, like, and they were like, fine. Do you just want the interview? I was like, yes, actually. So they gave me the interview and hired me that day. <laughs> it was just like, I was like, you don't get to keep losing my application. I want to watch you like 
take it. Like, don't lose this one. I know that I'm giving it to the hiring manager. But I feel like the interview is where she's going to lose it. And conveniently, they accidentally told her the wrong place and the wrong time to be, so she got disqualified again. Realizing that that embassy had it out for her and was not about to let a woman become a diplomat, she transferred to a different embassy in Turkey. Dipshits. So now it's 1933, she's living in Turkey, she's working as a receptionist at the embassy still, and she's just waiting for that next opportunity to apply to become a diplomat. One of her hobbies at this point in time is to go out hunting with a shotgun that her father had bought for her when she was a kid. It's an irregular hobby for a woman, but Virginia's an irregular type of woman. So she goes out hunting with her friends one day and they're hunting for snipes, which if you don't know is this little tiny bird. Apparently they're really hard to hit. And this is where the term sniper comes from. Regardless, oh. at one point she has to hop over a fence. She forgot to turn the safety on on a shotgun and accidentally blow her own foot off. Luckily, her friends were there and they managed to pick her up, get her to the hospital in time to save her life. While she's in the hospital recovering, she would end up getting gangrene, which is a very, very serious type of infection, especially back then in the 1930s because antibiotics weren't gonna be widely used or available for another decade. And I mean, the doctors back then are basically just grunts with scalpels. So they come over to Virginia. They're like, hey, here's the deal. You're gonna die. There's one chance that we can save you. Uh, basically, my medical opinion is your leg is pissed off and it's trying to kill you. My strategy is I'm going to kill it first. I'm going to cut it off and throw it away. So that's what they do. She gets amputated from the knee down. Later in her life, she would admit that while she was recovering in the hospital, her father had come to her in a dream and told her that she had to get through this because she had important work to do. So that's what she does. She makes a full recovery, gets a wooden prosthetic, learns how to walk again, and goes right back to trying to be an American diplomat. However, you got to remember, she's a complete tomboy. And what's the first thing a dude does? Does when he gets a new car, a new set of wheels, a new gun, he always gives it a name, right? Right. Virginia named her wooden leg Cuthbert. So she goes back. <laughs> good, good. I was thinking show it off, but no, give it a name. That is perfect. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> My laptop has a name. It does. It does have a name like what is it herbert emerson the third i think is what my laptop is called to work and continues trying to become a diplomat however now they have a legitimate reason to not let her become one they don't need to lose her application they don't need to give her the wrong dates and the wrong times anymore because apparently there was a pre-established rule that amputees were not allowed to become diplomats why what? i have no idea but it turns out that virginia has now both literally and figuratively shot herself in the foot <laughs> Virginia, being the badass that she is, though, isn't about to take no for an answer, so she wow. begins lobbying. The fucking rules. This is going to be a sweary episode, apparently. But, like, come on, guys. Really? What, what? Is that still a rule? Like, if it is, y'all need to, like, take a look at that. And by y'all, I mean the American government. <laughs> like, come on. Like, the ways that we, as culture and and gus as humanity in general have just striven to ensure that no one who doesn't fit a very boring particular mold can get anywhere is absolutely unreal and to have the rules changed altogether she doesn't have much success fast forward 1940 germany invades france and virginia is like fuck it i'm gonna go be an ambulance driver and help out the french because i hate nazis and that's exactly what she does Good. virginia a 35 year old woman that was physically unfit to be an american diplomat where she would have to sit in an office and talk to people is now on her way to france to be an ambulance driver in an active war zone so she's an ambulance driver driver all throughout the Battle of Paris, and she is one of, if not the first Americans to actually stand up and fight against the Nazis. After her. France falls, oh, she God. has to that, flee, that so she hops her. on Holy crap, was that her at 35? Yikes, they made him different, didn't, didn't they? <laughs> Oh no, if I look like if I'm like if I look like I'm 54 when I'm 35, I'm gonna be very upset. <laughs> I have a couple years left to go, and by a couple I mean more than two, but like uh oh. Not the first Americans to actually stand up and fight. Still, still, this is not about her looks, because the earlier pictures they showed of her, she was gorgeous. This is probably just a very terrible picture. Right? Probably. Also, this isn't like, doesn't matter what she looks like because she's awesome, is 
obviously where I'm going with this. Against the Nazis. After France falls, she has to flee, so she hops on a train and makes her way over to Spain. While she's at the train station, she meets a British intel officer and she tells him her story. This guy is so impressed that he's like, hey, take this phone number, call my friend. He can probably help find you a job over in England if that's where you want to go. So she calls a number looking for a job and that number puts her in contact with a man by the name of Nicholas Boddington, one of the head guys of the newly formed British SOE. SOE standing for Special Operations Executive, which is just the new spinoff of Great Britain's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, AKA their equivalent of the CIA. So she talks to them and they pretty much immediately want her to be a spy. She speaks German, she speaks French, she's lived in France, she understands the culture, and most importantly of all, she's an American. And this Ooh, is important see, that's because- a beautiful, that see, there she is. This is such a better picture. I'm so glad that there's a good photo of her. She is, she is stunning. Look at her. Look at those freak, look at her jawline. Okay, yeah, she's, she is gorgeous. That means she can use her actual American identity and all her real documentation to give to the Germans to get into France, posing as a journalist. Virginia immediately agrees and goes into training for the next six months, learning everything there is to know about espionage, or at least as much as she can in that amount of time. Fast forward six months later, mid-1941, Virginia Hall, the spy, gets dropped off in Vichy, so France. Pretty. Which, if you don't know, at this point in time, France is split in two. There's occupied France, and then there's unoccupied France, also referred to as Vichy France. France. Now, Vichy France is technically supposedly free, but pretty much everybody knows that it's a puppet state for the Nazis at this point. And Hall's job is to go in there posing as a journalist for the New York Post, build a spy network, and do anything she can to fuck with the Nazis. Okay, and just so we're on the same page, this isn't like the movies where she has like instructions to go meet with some guy that's her connection and she like integrates with this already existing spy network. No, she was the first spy to go in. She had to go in and build the network from scratch. They literally took Hall, a 35 year old woman with a wooden leg, gave her- And no experience, holy crap, oh my God. Virginia Hall, oh dang, okay. How have I never heard of her? Some money and some cyanide pills in case she got caught, sent her into enemy held territory and was like, fucking figure it out. So Hall shows up in Lyon, France and she doesn't even have anywhere to stay. All the hotel rooms are full, all the houses are rented. So many people have been displaced from the war, there's nowhere for her to stay. So when she first gets to France, she ends up living with a bunch of nuns at first and she like had a curfew, the whole nine yards. Then after a couple weeks, she finally gets a hotel room and that's where she sets up her headquarters and makes her first contact. She goes straight to the U.S. Embassy and tries to get their help. And the head of the U.S. Embassy is like, absolutely not. America's neutral. We want nothing to do with it. But the second in command of the American Embassy pulls her aside and he's like, yes, I'm willing to help. And this is really important Good. because this is the only way she's going to be able to communicate with London. You see, because it's an embassy, they have a diplomatic bag. So it's going to be mail that's not being screened by the Nazis before it goes out. So if this well, guy... they say, right? Like, that's always something that I've been confused. It's like, well, yeah, they, they're going to say they're not going to screen it, but like it's wartime and also they're Nazis. So like, are we trusting them to be honorable about this? I mean, if I was an American person and like I there's a Nazi embassy or whatever, I'm reading their mail. Like, I'm not going to they're not they're they're evil. I'm not going to. I'm not letting any of that get out unseen, you know, like, so I'm just like, I don't know. I don't trust that kind of thing. This is a safe mail. The Nazis aren't going to read. The Nazis aren't going to do something shady, really. Guys willing to slip her messages to London into the diplomatic bag. It's going to be the only way that she's going to be able to get communication outside of France. So she gets it done. She establishes a connection. She now has a way to communicate with the outside world. On to the next order of business. Go see the gynecologist. <laughs> Not for her, for the Nazis. You see, she has a two-pronged attack method that she's going to use to wreak havoc on the German ranks. Step A, recruit a gynecologist. Step B, recruit a brothel owner. All right, so here's the Nice! Point. Yes! Oh, brothel. Look, dude, I don't know what... The brothel, like, you hear ever Like, you would hear everything. Like, that is something that I really, really appreciate when they do it in, like, stories because it makes perfect sense. It's like, yeah, the prostitutes are going to hear a lot and there's so many stories throughout history too where it's just like the the pillow talk is how the information gets out there like because they 
person tells the pro it's like oh darling just tell me what you like you know just just a little whisper what are you so stressed about let's get you unstressed and how maybe i if you talk about it you can get it off your chest it's like oh it's brilliant it's so brilliant but yes i, I i'm curious about the kind of college i mean maybe because she's thinking in a similar vein like officials will talk to their wives and their wives will talk to the gynecologist you know it's like in a similar sort of vein so this way she gets information from lots of different places i like it it's so smart she gets this gynecologist to start working with her by the name of jean rosette and then she gets this brothel owner by the name of germaine garen to start working with her and the plan she works out is the brothel owner is going to send all of his employees to this particular gynecologist and he's going to sort out the ones that do not have STDs and the ones that do have STDs and he's not going to treat them but he's going to give them a clean bill of health and then the brothel owner is only going to let those ones sleep with the Nazis. So what? That's even better! I was thinking it's going to be an information thing but no, she's just going to get the Nazis STDs! Yeah! <laughs> that is even better than I could have imagined. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So already, Hall is establishing herself as a diabolical mastermind. I mean, she's ah! conducting biological warfare. Weapons of ass destruction, if you will. All the other spies are out here worried about intercepting mail and sending secret messages. And she's over here destroying the German... I'm gonna give you syphilis. It's amazing. And ranks from the inside out and making them enjoy it while she does it. And the scary part is, is she's just getting warmed up. You see, now she starts sending messages back to London through that diplomatic bag, asking for supply drops in the countryside, and she gets them. They're dropping off guns, explosives, and she's turning around, giving that to these guerrilla fighters that are just doing anything they can to fight the Germans. And she's also getting money to bribe officials and heroin. Yeah, the second prong of her prostitute attack on the German ranks is that after the employees have already given the Germans an STD, they are then also going to attempt to get them addicted to heroin. I mean, the Germans get all this credit for developing their brilliant blitzkrieg tactic during World War II, which translates to lightning war. I'm going to go ahead with whatever authority I have, and I'm going to dub this the brothel krieg tactic in honor of Virginia Hall, because this is brilliant. So this keeps going for months and months, and she develops so more and more connections and builds this enormous spy network that is officially given the code name Heckler. And every month, more and more spies are coming in, and she's helping them get set up. And these new spies know how to send wireless transmissions. So now there's other ways of getting messages outside of France but the problem is these wireless transmissions can get tracked by the Nazis and a lot of these new spies are getting caught that way. So then fast forward October 1941 all the other spies there's like 12 other ones in the area right now and they decide they're going to have a big meeting basically they're coming up with an excuse to get together and have a party and actually talk about all the cool stuff they've been doing which is a huge mistake for a spy. So yeah it is but somebody like okay seriously though tell me how this diplomatic bag thing is actually secure like the, the messages can get tracked, sure, sure, sure. The Nazis didn't read the mail? They just didn't go in through the... How? How could you be sure they weren't going to do that? Like, they just followed that rule? Like, I don't understand how that was secure. I just don't get it. it like, was it, like, under that much lock and key? Like, would they have had to kill, like, a whole bunch of people every time the mail went out in order to, like, read this mail? Like, I don't... I don't understand, so please, please, if you know, tell me in the comments, like, give me a freaking novel to read about it. I'm so fascinated to find out why that worked. So Virginia avoids it. Sure enough, all 12 spies get busted and captured, and this was known as the Marseille Mouse Trap, where the German Gestapo captured 12 spies all at once. They captured all the wireless operators, and again, Virginia is basically the only spy on the ground, and she is the only spy still capable of getting a message out to London. So she sends a message out to London, basically saying that everybody else has been captured, nobody else is going to be able to communicate except for her. In addition to that, the German Gestapo also now know what she looks like and have drawings of her, and they know that she walks with a limp, and they're starting to call her the limping lady. So she wow. is effectively number one on the Gestapo's most wanted list, and leading the Gestapo in Lyon at this point in time is Klaus Barbie, one of the most brutal Nazis of World War II. And he is quoted as saying, I would do anything to find that that limping Canadian bitch, end quote. He believed that she had- She's- what? 
She was from Baltimore, bitch. Had to be Canadian because he didn't think any American could speak French so fluently. <laughs> London then responds Please, by sir. saying, hey, that's terrible, A, but also go ahead and flee. Get out of the country. They're going to find you. They know what you look like. They know that you walk with a limp. And every time you take a step with your hollow wooden leg, there is a distinct wood noise they're gonna catch you. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but to this, Virginia basically said, hold my leg and watch this shit. Rather than flee, she decides that she's going to orchestrate a jailbreak of the other 12 spies that have been captured. But she's playing it on hardcore mode because the Germans know that they're looking for the limping lady, and every time she takes a step with her hollow wooden leg, it makes a wood noise. And then her plot armor activates and divine intervention kicks in because supplies into France are so low and so scarce that they're no longer getting rubber and leather to make shoes out of anymore and people have to start carving their shoes out of wood and all of a sudden everybody's walking around making wood noises completely disguising her movements so rather than fleeing the country she tracks down the prison that the 12 spies are being held at then finds somebody that works at the prison convinces them to get her a roster of the prisoners uses that to track down a different completely unrelated prisoner's wife on the outside befriend her and convince her to help her virginia not wanting to be seen herself because because they know what she looks like, decides that she's gonna have this other prisoner's wife start smuggling in supplies to the 12 spies and by extent, this woman's husband. Like they're baking handcuff keys and screwdrivers into cakes and shit to smuggle these supplies in. And this goes so well that she decides she's- I mean, I guess that would have had to have worked at some point, right? Like the, it, it became something that's like in cartoons and like it only, it would never work today because of extra machines, but like, it's one of those things, but it had to have worked at some point. It had to come from somewhere, right? She's really going to start showing off. She's going to try to smuggle in an entire wireless set into the prisoners. And the wireless set is like the size of a briefcase. So she gets a 70 year old priest that's a double amputee from World War One to smuggle this briefcase in by sitting on it in his wheelchair. And he ends up giving it to the other spies that actually know how to use the equipment. Here's the thing. The spies on the inside needed a really big antenna to make this thing work. So they ran a wire from their cell into this like wireless setup outside across the yard and attached it to the boundary fence using the entire fence as an antenna and wow. somehow never got caught. So now the spies are and transmitting messages from inside the prison directly to London. So fast forward like a month, Virginia has smuggled these guys everything they need to be able to break out from the inside. And once they get outside the boundary fence, she is going to be there to pick them up, get them to a safe house and smuggle them out of the country. Everything is completely arranged. Then on the day of the jailbreak, Virginia makes sure that somebody else tries to smuggle in a bunch of booze to the prisoners, knowing that they would get caught and that the guards would end up drinking all the alcohol that night making it easier for the spies to slip away. She's just like, how often can I drug or like get them drunk, get them messed up? Like now they're, now they're itching their privates because they all got gonorrhea. They like are high off their tits on heroin, drinking up a storm. This girl's like, I'm going to bring the party to you and you will love it in the moment, but it is going to wreck your day tomorrow. Like the whole time. Which is exactly what happens that night. All the guards are drinking, partying, having a good time. And while that's going on, the spies are utilizing the handcuff keys and all the tools Virginia smuggled in to escape. They run across the yard under the cover of night, scale the perimeter fence, and waiting there is Virginia, who immediately takes them to a safe house. They hide for two weeks straight while the entire Gestapo is searching everywhere for them, and then she smuggles them out of the country. Okay, fast forward a month. It's November 1942. She just staged that huge jailbreak. All the Germans are looking for her, and now the Gestapo is brought in and and she's still a month away from America joining the war for real, too. An additional 500 men, all with the sole purpose of finding the limping lady. It is at this moment Virginia decides it's probably time to leave. But with 500 new Gestapo all looking for a woman with a limp, she can't take any of the normal ways out of the country. So the only method she has to escape is to take the Pyrenees Freedom Trail, a 50 mile hike through the Pyrenees Mountains to cross the border between France and Spain. And she has to do it in November in the coldest winter for France in over 200 years. It is a three to four day hiking trail for people doing it for fun, not in the middle of winter. And Virginia manages to do it in two days 
Hercules with a wooden leg. During her hike, she was communicating with London via radio, not like secret spy radio, just normal radio transmissions. It wasn't going to blow her cover. She was already blown and she was leaving anyways, so it didn't really matter. And she would tell London that Cuthbert was giving her issues because I'm sure, as you can imagine, hiking with a wooden leg would get pretty tiresome after a while. It would appear so, wouldn't it? To which London, not knowing who Cuthbert was, responded by saying, if Cuthbert is giving you problems, have him eliminated. <laughs> Just kill him then, girl. Like, what are you even do? He's giving you issues. Kill him. Take him out. Take him out. So she crosses the border into Spain after two days. Complete badass. She has escaped the Nazis. And 48 hours after she leaves Lyon, her entire hotel room gets ransacked because the Germans finally figured out who she was. And she had escaped just in the nick of time. And then she promptly gets arrested by Spanish authorities for illegal immigration. So then she has to get a message out to London, out to America. They finally come, bail her out. She goes back to London working with the SOE and she's like, okay, well, cool, send me back in. And they're like, uh, no, your cover's blown. You've done all you're gonna do. Uh, that's, that's it for you. We're not gonna let you do anything else as far as like actively working undercover goes. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but Virginia Hall basically says, okay, well, peace out nerds. I'm gonna go work with the Americans. She goes over to America, goes to the OSS, the direct predecessor of the CIA, and is like, hey, I'm more experienced than any spy you guys have. Put me in, coach. To which the OSS is like, sure, why not? And they give her a shot. This They're like, you're a woman. We don't care. Go, go die. Sure. Well, maybe you, maybe you do something good, but you're a woman. So maybe not, but either way, I don't care. Like the risk is worth the reward. You know, you're a woman. This time, Virginia makes sure that she takes a wireless transmitting class though. So now she can also send the wireless transmitting signals. She doesn't want to be the only spy not able to like last time. So she does that. She then realizes that she's going to have to pretend to be a much older woman. This would help disguise her limp and it would help change her face so that they didn't know what she looked like anymore. So she goes to a professional Hollywood makeup artist, learns how to do makeup to look like a really old woman, and then she goes to a dentist in London that grinds all her teeth down so she looks like she has terrible teeth like a French peasant would. The she actually, d oh my God, that is like committing to the fucking bit. Just, ugh, no. Do you think the Germans are going to look that close at your perfect teeth? Some of them might. Oh, no, that is committing to the fucking bit. The OSS then sneaks her back into France on a PT boat and drops her off completely by herself again. And from there, she just starts doing it all over again. She develops a huge spy network again. This time she's posing as an elderly milkmaid by day and a spy master by night. At this point in time, the French resistance had all kinds of guerrilla fighters, but they were basically just running around blowing shit up, being as big of a nuisance as they possibly could and weren't being strategic about it at all. So over the course of the next year and a half, Virginia set out to establish a chain of command and actually get them to work together and coordinate attacks and efforts. By 1944, she had amassed an entire army. She had three battalions, 1,500 guerrilla fighters that she was coordinating attacks against the Germans with from the inside, all while transmitting signals to the Americans to have them drop off supplies like guns and explosives to continue fighting with. She would then be notified that in June of 1944, D-Day was gonna happen. And in the weeks leading up to it, she used her guerrilla army to coordinate and sabotage major highways, railroads, communication lines, and bridges, preventing the Germans from reinforcing the right beaches in a timely fashion, potentially changing the entire course of D-Day. And somewhere around this time frame, the OSS would send in a reinforcement to help Virginia out, a young Polish operative by the name of Paul Giot. He parachuted into theater too late to have any real influence on the operation, but him and Virginia would end up falling in love. After the war, they would both move back home to America where Paul would get his citizenship and they would both begin. And they all have the little poodles with the same hairstyle as her. In their careers working for the newly found CIA. They would then go on to lead a specialized task force monitoring communism in the Eastern Bloc of Europe. Yeah, this incredible story literally ends with two spies falling in love and going out on missions together. In 1945, President Truman wanted to give Virginia the Distinguished Service Cross, the highest honor a civilian could receive because technically spies weren't in the military, so they're ineligible for the Medal of Honor. But 
President Truman wanted to give this to her in a humongous ceremony, tell her story, and make her basically an international hero and celebrity. Virginia, however, declined that offer because she didn't want her cover blown. She still wanted to be operational and capable of helping the United States and the wow. world if she was needed. She became the only female civilian of World War She's still really, like, I mean, however old she is here, like... Like, again, her bone structure is just, like, phenomenal. Like, how? Two, ...to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and was awarded to her by General William Donovan and by her own request, it was awarded in front of only one witness, her mom. Her future husband and fiancé, Paul, wasn't there because she didn't think her mother would approve. <laughs> She's like, hey, mom, but like, I feel like it's still like a F you, mom. like, look what I did, mom. You wanted me to go home and get married to that cheating scum. Like, are you kidding me? Look what I did. I'm getting a distinguished cross because I'm the baddest ass. <laughs> but like my husband, my husband to be, I don't think you'll like him because he's not rich enough. So like, we'll just only you. This woman was behind enemy lines fighting against the Nazis for all of World War II, the entire thing, longer than probably any time. other American, and she's still scared of the opinions of mom. And that's, that's fair. Moms are scary. Moms are very, moms can be very terrifying. That's it. Virginia and Paul would live happily ever after. They retired at 60 years old and Virginia would pass away at the age of 76 in 1982. And nobody knew anything about this until they read her obituary. She never gave an interview. She never wrote a memoir. She never said a single thing. And later in life, when she was asked why she never talked about it, she said, and I quote, too many of my friends died for talking too much, which I think we can all agree is gangster as fuck. So in conclusion, this is a story of Virginia Hall, the deadly a spy of World War II. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Wow. The fact that people know and care more about Kim Kardashian over Virginia Hall is going to piss me off probably for the rest of forever. Yeah, that's fair. Probably me too now. It's like now that I know about Virginia Hall. She is uh, clearly awesome. That was like, just wow. <laughs> um, that, I can't believe I never heard of her. I mean, I guess I have somebody else to look into, like, she seems awesome. Like, there's some really cool, like, World War II lady uh, fighters, like, 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 Ludmilla something, like, who had the highest kill count of any sniper in World War II. Like, there's some cool ladies out there who do some really fun stuff. I never heard of her. That's awesome. And I love the way that she, like, went around, went about her, her duty. <laughs> like... I would not have considered the STD thing. Like, that's so smart. <laughs> that's such a good idea. I was just thinking, like, gaining information, you know? All right. Well, that was fantastic. I adored that. Um, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And let me know what I should react to next. Don't forget to like and subscribe this video. Don't forget to show the fat electrician some love. I'm sure that if you're here, you don't. You will absolutely watch his videos as well. Let me know what I should react to next. Um, and I will see you all in the next video.